Hello again everyone, it's me Matt, hope you're having a great day, we're talking about armoured fighting vehicles again. This time, the little light tanks, not the big heavy duty guys that we've talked about in the past with the main battle tank variants. I've actually done a video on light tanks, we'll touched on them a little bit in terms of their airborne or air mobile configuration, how they can be dropped out the back of planes, and this is actually one of the tanks that is relatable to that video. If you want to go check it out, it's in the uh, clicking link at the top here. But specifically today we are talking about the XM8 AGS, or Armoured Gun System. It's a cool little tank, uh, and I say little in every sense of the word, because it's almost like it's a compressed pattern crossed Abrams. It's kind of a strange looking vehicle, but really, really cool nonetheless. And something that I think we're going to see a lot more in in the future is these lightly armoured smaller vehicles, but with a big punch to them. So let's talk about its development and how it came to be. So from the 1970s to the 1990s, the standard light tank of the US Army was the M551 Sheridan. Although it performed reasonably well in conflicts it took part in, the Sheridan was not the most successful American vehicle ever developed, and once again you can go check out the video I made on that vehicle too. Its protection level was very poor, and it suffered from mechanical issues early in its purchase, and therefore it comes to no surprise that starting in the late 1970s, the US military was actively looking to purchase another such light vehicle to replace the rapidly aging Sheridan. This was especially true for the US Airborne Forces of the 82nd Airborne Division which was in need of a light, mobile air transport firepower machine. Throughout the 1980s, a number of light tank prototypes appeared as part of the armoured gun system program, but none of them have been more successful than the XM8. The XM8 was designed by FMC, or more specifically its subsidiary of United Defence, as part of the armoured gun system program to replace the Sheridan itself. The main goal of the project was to provide the US Army with a vehicle with sufficient firepower and ability to withstand artillery shrapnel and impacts and also infantry operated anti-tank weapon fire. Arguably the most important feature however was the ability to deploy such a vehicle by means of low velocity airdrop from a C-130 or C-17 in order for the vehicle to be attached to the 82nd Airborne. To make the vehicle suitable for multiple types of operations, the XM8 could be configured with three possible armour options that influence the vehicle's weight but increase the protection. The level 1 package offered basic protection against small arms and shell fragments. The hull itself is made of aluminum or aluminium with Kevlar liners with certain parts of the hull, turret side and rear having a ceramic inlay, forming a composite armour layer resistant to some types of heat projectiles. This basic configuration was intended for low intensity conflicts and its airdrop weight was around 35,500 pounds or 16,102 kilograms, while the combat weight was actually 39,800 pounds or 18,053 kilograms. In its level 1 configuration, the XM8 was airdroppable from either a C-130 or a C-17. Alternatively, the C-17 could carry three of these vehicles if airdrops were not required. The Level 2 package was an alternative armour kit which provided extra protection against artillery and infantry threats. The aluminium or aluminium Kevlar frontal armour is reinforced by titanium inlays, which the sides and the rear of the vehicle are covered by an additional layer of aluminium or aluminium space armour. So when the vehicle was equipped, the vehicle hits around 44,000 pounds dry, and normally around 46,300 pounds as its combat weight or 21,001 kilograms. The important thing to note is that the level 2 armour kit of the XM8 cannot be airdropped anymore from the C-130. However, on its own it can be carried in one configuration and airdropped from the C-17. The level 3 package was the highest level of protection for the XM8 at the time. It can achieve and consist level 2 armour package ratings with additional passive tiles attached to the vehicle upper frontal plate and upper sides, significantly increasing the protection against infantry held heat anti-tank based weapons. Level 3 increases only the protection for the hull. The turret uses the same kit as the level 2 variant. This version when transported weighed around 49,500 pounds or 22,453 kilograms, making it far too heavy for the C-130 to even carry. It can still however be dropped from the C-17. The combat weight of this vehicle was 51,000 pounds or 23,133 kilograms. It's worth noting that a C5 Galaxy could actually carry five of these vehicles of any type of variant, which just goes to prove how amazing the C5 Galaxy is, which I will be doing a video on in the future, so stand by for that. The XM8 was originally, in September of 1993, to be powered by the 550 horsepower Detroit Diesel 6V92TA 9 litre diesel or GP8 engine, 
This was paired to the General Electric HMPT 500 3EC transmission, allowing the vehicle to go to a very impressive 45 miles an hour or 72 kilometers an hour, and which really put a testament to its speed and ability as a light tank. The vehicle was armed with an experimental, automatically loading Water Valet XM35 105mm low recoil gun in its FNC development turret. The gun could fire 12 rounds per minute and had 21 ready rounds available, with 9 to 24 more stowed within the vehicle. The gun could elevate plus 20 degrees and depress minus 10 degrees. The secondary weapon was the obvious 7.62mm M240 machine gun, and the vehicle could also be armed with a Commander's 50 caliber machine gun or grenade launcher. The crew compartment was a crew of three, the Commander, Gunner and Driver, negating the need for a loader anymore because it automatically loads. The Gunner was sitting on the right side of the gun, and the left side was filled with the FSMC designated autoloader mechanism. The Commander sat behind him, and the Driver was in place of the hull itself in the lower portion. The vehicle was generally quite well designed, but military budget cuts of the 1990s proved to be its undoing. The vehicle contract was initially assigned to FMC, and six prototypes were built and tested. All of them reportedly still exist somewhere in various states of disrepair, which makes me kind of sad because I hate knowing vehicles just get left behind to rot. These things in my eyes are like idols, icons, literally pieces of history. Even if they were never developed fully or actually made in terms of production, they're still an armoured fighting vehicle and for crying out loud, if you don't want it, send it to me, I'll take it and put it in my bloody backyard. In September of 1993, FMC presented the vehicle to the military and they were very, very impressed with it. There were plans to produce 297 of the vehicles from 1997 onwards, but the project was ultimately cancelled in 1996. FMC allegedly tried to find customers abroad, but just failed to do so. The 3rd Battalion, 73rd Regiment of one of the units to be equipped with the M8s continued to use their Sheraton tanks until it was disbanded in 1997. The other unit, the 2nd Armoured Cavalry Regiment, was instead armed with the N1128 Striker Fire Support Vehicle. In the recent years, the United States Army began to consider reviving the XM8 program as an affordable, mobile and air transportable fire support vehicle. The XM8 still to this day could be revived. It's a very viable product and a very viable system that could be quite easily integrated into almost any battle group. A lightweight tank that's air mobile, has a lot of firepower, very quick and has multiple modular configurations of armor. It is a little sad to know that this tank did not make it across the drawing boards, as we see with many of my videos that I talk about, prototype vehicles never really make it beyond a lot of things, because it's always down to money or politics. Of course I can't talk too much about that, due to my specific role in the military right now, but it is really heartbreaking to know that a vehicle of this kind, that was actually very good on paper and did very well for itself as an you know, air mobile tank support vehicle, just never came to be, and I just made a video recently about how artillery is integral to being air mobile and airborne uh, on the battle space, and this is something that I think we're going to see a lot more of in the future. I'm not too sure why we're not seeing more of it, why we're not capitalizing on this light tank capability. You know, main battle tanks are amazing, I love them, they're incredible pieces of hardware and engineering and firepower, but when you think about the logistics and the, the you know, the modularity of this vehicle and how well it can be utilized, it's almost like a no-brainer to me that you can place three of these things or five of these things on an aircraft, fly them out to an aircraft um, drop point, and basically have armored support to an infantry unit extremely quickly, almost on site within the hour. That's incredible. Uh, the logistics to resupplying them may be a little difficult, but because of this thing being so, you know, lightweight and easy to move around and so quick and speedy, you don't have to worry as much about fuel, you know, you don't have a ton of extra weight that you're dragging around. Some of the main battle tanks out there today, we're talking nearly 70 tons. That's insane. Uh, these vehicles are lightweight, maneuverable, and speedy, and that's kind of what you want. The three-man crew is definitely viable in this configuration. I'm not a huge fan of auto loaders, but when it comes to a vehicle of this type and, you know, style, of tank, it's very, very applicable, and I think it's really, really useful to have something like that because you don't want the additional space uh, and weight, of course, of carrying a fourth crew member on the vehicle. Let the machine do the work. Of course, you do add a little bit of risk when you put auto loaders into vehicles like this because, especially when they're air dropped in, they don't have the logistic and mechanical uh, support they would normally have to repair things like an auto loader. But, you know, if you've got a robust enough auto loader system in there, then you should be fine. 
Folks, I really appreciate you stopping by today on today's video. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a little bit about the XM8. If you did enjoy it, I'd really encourage you to hit the like button. It really does help me on YouTube. It's a quick thing you can do that really makes a huge impact on getting more videos and content out to those who are subscribed to me. As you see on many of my videos lately, uh, very strangely, we just don't have the number of views that I used to have. I'm not sure what's going on. Kind of just take it with a pinch of salt. YouTube does their own sort of thing. Um, but I hope you did enjoy the video. If you want to be notified of any upcoming content, please click the little bell by the subscribe button. If you want to support my channel, and for those of you who have been, thank you. You can go check out my Patreon page. It is a, a donation website that you can uh, contribute towards. And thank you to everyone so, so much for doing that. I, I truly, though, mean that in every sense of the word. I appreciate you. Thank you. And for those of you who just stopped by today and watched, thank you also. It means a lot to me for you to actually come watch my content. Um, you also have all my other sorts of social media and things like that in the description box below. I've got my merchandise store and things like that. So if you want to go check that out, you can. And I hope I see you on the next video, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.